Okay, so my name is Brent Waters. I'm gonna be talking about detecting uh, dangerous queries, a new approach to chosen ciphertext security. Um, this is joint work with uh, Susan Hohenberger and Alison Luco. So one of the great advents of uh, cryptography, I think, is public key encryption, where Bob can send a message to Alice by just knowing her, um, encrypt a me uh, message to Alice just knowing her public key, send it on over, and then Alice can decrypt um, knowing her secret key. Now, where it gets um, somewhat interesting is how we think, what do we mean by security? How do we capture security for these schemes? Um, one way, maybe the, the first most natural one, is to think of um, some type of passive security, like uh, a chosen plaintext attack, where we have our attacker at the bottom who's eavesdropping on the channel, um, gets the ciphertext, and tries to distinguish or figure out um, what's inside it. However, uh, perhaps a more robust and useful model for security is something known as chosen ciphertext security, where an attacker can actually um, inject messages herself, and in particular might create a ciphertext, um, send it to Alice, have Alice decrypt it, and let's say somehow use this answer to help her in discerning what's inside that, um, what's inside that other message. Now for a long while we've actually been able to um, uh, formalize these notions of security in terms of uh, games. For example, in, uh, in the indistinguishability and the chosen plaintext uh, attack game, uh, the attacker, uh, the challenger first uh, sends the attacker to a public key. Uh, the attacker will then pick two messages, M0 and um, M1 of equal length. Then the challenger flips a coin B, and it's going to encrypt the, mess, um, encrypt the message M sub B under the public key. I'm gonna call that CT star over there, the challenge ciphertext. And um, finally, um, it, it submits a guess um, B prime. And we see the advantage of the attacker is the probability that B is equal to B prime minus one half. And in general, a scheme will be considered to be secure um, if this value is uh, negligible. Now, for chosen ciphertext security, the pattern is going to be um, very similar in the terms of this indistinguishability game like we had before. Um, but we're going to also endow this attack with more power in that he will get to send ciphertext um, to the challenger, and the challenger will decrypt um, them for him. So this will actually happen um, both before and after seeing the challenge ciphertext, CD star, um, with this one uh, very important restriction that uh, C the challenge, after seeing CT star, um, he cannot actually ask for a decryption of the challenge ciphertext itself, or else the game would be trivial to break. So that's chosen ciphertext security. Now before I get into, um, okay, and then CCA1 is where we move uh, the second oracle. Now before I get into uh, the results in this talk, um, I at least want to put in perspective what I consider to be the very big, grand, huge challenge of everything, which is can you, um, take any chosen plaintext secure scheme and build a transformation to um, a chosen ciphertext secure scheme. Now, we know very little about this problem. It's still um, very wide open, um, but I don't know, I like to sort of, whenever I think of anything in this realm, I like to, I think it's important to kind of keep this um, bigger goal um, in, in mind. So while we haven't shown the big, bigger goal, there's been um, some notable results uh, along the lines of figuring out chosen ciphertext security, only some of which I'm gonna be able to call out here. Uh, for example, using non-interactive zero knowledge proof techniques, we can um, build CCA security from trapdoor pairings, like and the RSA assumption, and also um, so trapdoor permutations, RSA assumption, and pairings. Um, but we don't know how to do it um, from DDH or lattices. Um, kind of something I, 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 I um, grouped as Kramer Shoot Plus, starting let's say about 14 years ago in '98, we started knowing how to do it with DDH, um, Pali encryption. Um, more recently, I think Coffins and Kilts had an efficient factoring solution, and so on and so forth. And, um, but we didn't know how to do lattices. And then uh, about four years ago or so, myself and um, Chris Piker uh, introduced lossy TDFs, which could, um, in some sense, finish off the, num the number theory, um, or at least the main, we're able to prove it now under the main number theoretic constructions. Okay, um, one other piece of work I also want to call to note was this interesting problem uh, proposed by uh, My Myers and Shalott a couple years ago. And they want to ask the question is, suppose I give you some scheme, which is, I'll tell you it's one bit CCA secure. That is, it can, it can encrypt one bit and it's CCA secure. And the question is, can we um, encrypt many bits or n bits um, and still get CCA security? Um, and the first thing to notice is the thing I would think of when I first do this, okay, well, maybe we just append these together. And straightforward appending um, actually doesn't work. So suppose I want to encrypt um, three-bit messages, and I just do it by, I, I use call in, encryption scheme first to encrypt um, one, then encrypt one again, and then zero, and I shove these all together, and I call these things the ciphertext. 
Well, it's a very easy attack. Um, let's say I just do, I swip the, flip the order, for example, of two of these. And now I have a new ciphertext, and if I query this new ciphertext um, and get the answer for it, um, it'll tell me how to, how to break the original ciphertext. So, so this type of straightforward appending is very easy to um, break. Uh, I'll say in the Meyerschlot, they actually did solve this problem, um, and they had what I thought were a lot of neat ideas. Um, on the other hand, they, I thought they had some heavyweight machinery and it was uh, uh, perhaps more a bit complex than it eventually um, needed to be. Uh, so in some sense, one thing we'll do in this work is try to capture this result in the process and also have a simpler explanation for it, uh, amongst other things. Okay, so coming to our result, um, I'm going to introduce a new notion of uh, chosen ciphertext security, which I call detectable chosen ciphertext security. Um, this isn't a goal in and of itself, but I think it's a good target in that a lot of different um, natural type of schemes I think can map into it, hopefully um, more over time. And I'll also show how to build this um, ladder over here in that we can take any detectable scheme and build it to a, cho a fully chosen ciphertext secure, secure scheme, which is what we, um, what we actually want. Okay, so before I formally define it, let me give you a little intu intuition about what DCCA detectable CCA security is about. The main idea here is that it's um, CCA secure as long as what we avoid what I call dangerous queries. And these queries are bad or dangerous relative to the challenge ciphertext. Uh, we're gonna have two properties about this. First of all, it should be hard to produce these dangerous queries before seeing the challenge ciphertext. Before seeing the ciphertext I wanna attack, I can't really create any bad queries for it. Um, the second property is that um, if someone comes up with a dangerous query, you can actually detect it. You, you can tell, oh, um, asking this, what this uh, ciphertext is is going to be bad, is going gonna, is gonna to help someone attack um, this other ciphertext. So I can give a, a very concrete example here. Um, consider this one-bit CCA scheme that I talked about earlier, uh, or, or let's say three-bit CCA scheme, which came from concatenating one-bit ciphertext together. Um, this is actually a detectable scheme in that um, a dangerous query is any type of reordering or copying of any of the original blocks. And you can see um, it's both like hard to produce before you see the ciphertext that I, um, well, can't move around too much here. Uh, before you see the ciphertext that I put up here, um, you won't be able to copy any of those blocks. You won't be able to predict or guess what they are. Um, however, it's also very easy. You know, if, 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 that's, if CT stars my ciphertext and I come up with another ciphertext which copies one of these blocks, um, just by comparison, it's very easy to tell um, if it's a dangerous query. So this is a very natural example um, or, or an example from before, at least, that um, capture, that detectable captures. Okay, so um, getting a little more um, formal, uh, detectable encryption system will have the usual algorithms, um, set up, encrypt, and um, decrypt that we're, all, that we're all used to. And um, however, I'll also give another fun, I'll also add something else to any detectable scheme, which would be a, a detection function f, which takes as input a public key, ct star, think of this as the challenge ciphertext, and ct, and I'll put zero or one, um, one indicating if the query is um, dangerous and um, zero if it's not. All right, so the scheme is gonna have two, two security properties. Uh, the first one is gonna be this hard to predict property. I'm gonna give you, a, there's two versions of it. I'm gonna give you a strong one. It says suppose we give the attacker um, actually both the public key and the secret key, and then the attacker gives um, a us a ciphertext and a message, and then we encrypt this message to come up with CT star. Um, it should be hard for the attacker to come up with a dangerous query for anything where f of public key ct and ct star is equal to one. Th this value should be negligible if it's secure. Uh, the main point here is that the attacker has to give the ciphertext that he's trying to make dangerous and, um, before seeing ct star. So it should be hard to come up with a dangerous query um, before um, seeing it. Uh, the second property is gonna be um, a game a lot like CCA security, which I have up here, except for we're gonna make um, one important change before we had this restriction that CT was not equal to CT star, um, here we're gonna replace it with the restriction that you can't make any dangerous queries in the second phase. Okay, so the two properties are that it's hard to create something um, a priori that's dangerous, let's say, and then um, an indistinguishability game where we just disallow, um, where we disallow dangerous queries. Now, um, I'll just remark that uh, detectable CCA security lies somewhere in between um, C full CCA security and, and uh, CCA1 security. Okay, now what hopefully motivates it is that, uh, the, like, uh, it seems like a, at least a natural target for, for, for multiple, multiple different things. Um, first, um, probably the, the leading example, let's say, 
is this um, one bit to many bit um, that I um, talked about before, but it also captures some other things like um, tag-based encryption and uh, what I loosely call sloppy or heuristic CCA, the, kind of to catch the idea, maybe if you try to make a chosen ciphertext scheme and here's the bar for, for getting a chosen ciphertext secure and you fall a little bit under it, it might still be detectable, so if you apply our process to it, you might be able to jump back up to, um, uh, to what you want. Uh, I mean, I should remark that the middle one, there are other ways to, to boost this up to full CCA secure, but it's uh, kind of, I think, neat that it, um, this thing captures all these notions. Okay, so now that I hopefully motivated um, why it's an interesting thing to study, let's see now how we actually can take a detectable scheme and bring it all the way to fully uh, CCA secure. Uh, there's gonna be three ingre basic ingredients in building it. Um, first, this detectable notion I talked to you about. Uh, second is going to be chosen plain text security, the plain thing. And the last one is what I call um, one, what's been called uh, one bounded CCA security, which is CCA security if you just get one query, doesn't matter whether it's before or after the chosen ciphertext. Uh, it turns out that these are all implied, you know, we can get all these from detectable CCA. This direction is uh, pretty trivial, and this other direction going to, um, I guess, your, your left is, uh, has been done in, in, in previous work. Okay, and then another like little thing I'm gonna use for this talk is that I'm gonna consider messages to be in zero, one star, and randomness to just be uh, of length of the security parameter. So the random coins are just always n bits. Um, this can be justified by PRGs. Okay, so let's see how the construction works. Uh, first, there's the setup scheme, which um, is fairly simple. We're just gonna run the setup schemes for the one bounded CPA scheme and detectable scheme, and come up with um, three public key, secret key pairs, which I call A and B, um, keys and also the inner key. And so the public key would be that triple of public keys and the secret key is a triple of um, secret keys. Okay, so you just want to run the setup algorithm for each of them. Now for encrypt, let's say we want to encrypt a message under the public key. Uh, we first start out by choosing um, three, random, th three random values, which would be the random coins for the encryption schemes, which I'll call RA, RB, and R inner. Uh, next, we're going we're to do some type of nested encryption eventually. I'm going to encrypt so create what I call C in, which I'll encrypt under the detectable scheme, I'll encrypt um, under that public key, and the message will be the main message itself, but I'm also gonna encrypt these random values as part of the message, and the coins will be R in. So these used here are actually not as coins, but more treated as a message. Um, then what I'm gonna do is I have this inner layer, now I'm gonna create the two outer layers. So I'm gonna take um, ciphertext A will be encrypted un as under the one bounded key, um, I'll encrypt as the message C in under randomness RA, and I'll create CB in a um, similar manner. Um, so I'll encrypt CB in a very similar manner, and the ciphertext at the end will just be um, CA comma CB. So th this is what it looks like. Um, the inner ciphertext is this uh, yellow thing you, you see on the inside over here, and the A cipher, CA is the, the, the green part, and CB is the blue part. So both, both of the CA and CB are encrypting this um, yellow inner part. Okay, um, so now let's see how we actually can do um, decryption. So to decrypt the ciphertext, what we first do is um, unwrap the left half, the A half of the ciphertext, and we get um, C and prime. Um, then we get mes message, and then we um, unwrap C and prime itself using another decryption, and we get M prime, R A prime, R B prime, which are the claimed uh, message and encryption randomness for that. Uh, after that, we're actually gonna do sort of something like an integrity check. We're gonna wanna make sure whoever created the ciphertext um, you know, did it in the legitimate way, or at least came close to it. So what we'll actually do is re-encrypt the two outer ciphertext and um, make sure that it's what we started with. So we'll get, okay, uh, the, this guy is saying here, okay, I'm encrypting this, um, this C and, C and prime under randomness RA. We can actually check that he did, whether he did this or not by, since we have every, everything, we have all the randomness ourselves, we can actually do this. And similarly for RB. Uh, what what's this, gonna, this is gonna allow us to do, it's gonna create a scheme where um, eventually the proof, if we encrypt it from the left half or the right half, or decrypt it from the left half or the right half, no one could actually tell um, which one we did. Okay, so decryption, it looks like we unwrap the left half, then we unwrap that, um, just get this little part over here, and then we re-encrypt and test. Okay, so um, since I won't have um, a chance to actually prove, uh, you know, show the proof of the scheme or anything, I just wanna give you a, few, a little bit of an intuition about the ideas of what's going on here. Um, so the features of the scheme, uh, they have some ideas from Meyer Shalott, but it looks a little bit like a Noor-Yung two-key system. 
Like, I'm going to encrypt this message, which, ha which happens to be ye the yellow ciphertext. I'm going to encrypt it under two keys using the um, NY2 key paradigm. Um, in the uh, Noor Jung um, paradigm, though, they made sure this was done correctly. It was very important that um, this wasn't faked, and they made sure of this by doing a non interactive Zill knowledge proof where you prove that you did it correctly, and before decrypting, someone would check this proof. Uh, here we don't have NISX, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have that, but instead we, we check that the structure's there with this re-encryption mechanism that, that, that effectively checks the same thing. Um, so here we're using embedded randomness instead of NISX. Uh, okay, so I guess what I tried to draw, um, have here was a double-edged sword um, to mean that, uh, to mean that the, um, this idea of embedded randomness has good and bad. Uh, the good is we can get something like this um, NY, this um, uh, two key type of paradigm going on where we don't know which side we're decrypting, someone can't tell which side we're decrypting from. Um, the bad is um, encrypting, in an encryption scheme, encrypting your own randomness is usually a, sometimes a bad idea or, or a tricky idea or can, can make things go wrong or broken or at least make um, proofs very hard. Um, so here it made, uh, it makes, the question is somehow if we're um, gonna use the outer ciphertext security intuitively at some point, um, it's, it's weird to have its randomness embedded and, and that's gonna be a, a, a kind of a pain for getting, for getting the proof to go through. Uh, okay, so let me, um, I won't have any time to um, give the actual proof itself, but I can try to give maybe just a little insight into it. Um, first of all, uh, the focus of the proof is what is the problem? Um, the main problem we're gonna try to say that doesn't, that doesn't happen, that we need to argue that doesn't happen is getting problem queries. So imagine that the CA star and CB star are a challenge ciphertext, and CN star is the inner part of the challenge ciphertext. Um, a problem query is when I get a, I get a challenge ciphertext, um, C, and I decrypt the left half, and I get C and prime, where C and prime is, rel is um, dangerous relative to C and star. Um, if, if this never happened, if I could like argue that this didn't happen, uh, this bad event, which I'm defined over here, didn't happen, then I would be like home free. Like uh, then I could use the detectable property if these dangerous queries didn't happen, the detectable property would be um, just enough for me to um, finish things off. So the proof and the, 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 the hard work of the proof is making sure that this um, thing doesn't actually happen. Okay, uh, so let me try to give you a high level overview. Um, I'll skip through this. Uh, so the main idea here is we're gonna kind of consider two different distributions, one which encrypts the normal randomness and another one where even the um, coins are not embedded, okay? So, so just keep in mind, we can consider these two different distributions. Okay, um, so here's the main idea of, or, or the proof overview. We're gonna try to eliminate this bad event. Uh, the first thing we're gonna do is we're actually gonna eliminate the bad event when the random, in this kind of uh, pretend case that doesn't really even come up in real life when um, the randomness is not embedded. And there we'll be able to use the NCPA and the one bounded scheme to be able to argue security, use the NOR um, Young trick, and, and there we kind of get things are sort of easier because the, ran the adversary's queries have to embed, embed the randomness, but we don't have to. It's, so it's a, sort of this pretend game where things are able to, um, to go through. Okay, so that's great, but that, that doesn't really um, help us for the case w we really care about, when we or it doesn't directly help us with the case where um, we really care about. However, um, then we're gonna move on to the step of um, trying to argue that this bad event that, um, of a dangerous inner query doesn't happen when the randomness is embedded. And uh, we could try to go through the same proof steps as before, but we'll get stuck somewhere. So instead, what we're gonna do is be able to do an indirect inference from, from, from the previous case. Uh, the main idea here, and if you do get a chance to look at the paper, I think this is kind of, the, unfortunately, the interesting thing that I'll have to go over quickly. Um, usually, when you're doing a security proof, um, you try to, and the adversary's making these queries, you try to uh, answer all these queries, get to the end, and the adversary's gonna tell you what it thinks. And you know you, you use what it thinks in order to to break your in order to break the assumption. Here, and you don't want to get stuck. You don't want to get stuck where you can't simulate any further because then you won't hear what the adversary says. In, in this game, in the kind of this point number two, you can go further, and the adversary might give you a query where you get stuck. And normally this would be and you can't simulate anymore. Normally this would be really bad, but in this case, the fact that he made this query itself um, tells you something, and um, and lets you break the detectable game. So obviously this, I apologize for the um, high um, hand review, overview, but um, this is kind of what I think was the neat thing. And also there were um, hints of this, there were parts of this idea in the Meyer Shalott thing. And then once you eliminate the bad event, finishing off isn't too, too hard. 
Okay, so um, in summary, we create a new abstraction called detectable CCA security. Um, we can uh, it build ch full chosen ciphertext security from it. Uh, it covers multiple things like the one bit to many bit, tag based, and more. Uh, one of the main things is this embedded randomness, and um, it's both a blessing and it has its problems. And the way to get around it is this kind of indirect argument, which uh, I thought may be one of the most interesting things um, of the work. And um, I'll just conclude by like throwing up what, uh, again, what I think the picture is here. Um, probably not to scale, uh, to, to be honest, but uh, you know, we built this ladder in between detectable CCA and um, full CCA, and you know, obviously these other gaps um, remain um, unsolved. I don't know, maybe th this is an interesting one to, to think of in, in the near future or re-examine. Okay, um, thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, Sarah? Do you have a construction of a DCCA scheme? Uh, sure, well, for, for example, I, I threw up um, tag-based encryption um, and, and cited many examples. Uh, um, I guess IK has one. I mean, there's many tag-based encryption schemes that I, that I could plug in there. Um, one interesting thing is like even the PW, the Piker Writers, like when we first gave our lossy TDF paper, we first described a CCA1 scheme. It happened to also be detectable. So a lot of the schemes that you might think of as just, and also Kennedy Hillary Katz, they had a light version of their scheme. A lot of these things that you might think are only CCA1 happen to be detectable. Any more questions? Okay, then let's thank Brent again. Oh, thank you.